In a tranquil suburb, the Johnson family was well known for their close bond and cheerful get-togethers. They often spent evenings sharing stories, laughter, and enjoying delicious home-cooked meals. Tonight was no exception, filled with warmth and camaraderie as they dined together. As their evening of light-hearted conversation wound down, the doorbell rang unexpectedly. Emily, the eager 12-year-old, sprang from her seat, racing her father and brother to the door. She returned quickly, looking puzzled. A police officer is here, Dad. He wants to talk to you, she said. Tom felt a wave of anxiety but kept his composure for his children. He approached the door and greeted the officer. Are you Tom Johnson? The officer asked. Yes, that's me, Tom replied. And are you Sarah Johnson's husband? The officer continued. With Tom's nod, the officer glanced at the children. Could we speak in private, Mr. Johnson? Tom's throat tightened. Mike, Emily, go to your rooms. I need to speak to the officer alone. The children began to protest, but Tom's firm now sent them scurrying. They weren't used to seeing him so stern. Once they were gone, the officer turned back to Tom. Mr. Johnson, I have some bad news. Your wife's plane is missing and presumed to have crashed. It disappeared from radar tonight on its way to Chicago. A search team is looking for survivors. Tom's heart sank. Sarah, a regional VP for a major corporation, was traveling with the CFO to their Midwest office. A seasoned traveler, Sarah's flight was supposed to be routine. Tom hadn't been worried when she called about her trip, but now he faced his worst nightmare. Her plane had vanished. The officer provided more details, none comforting, and promised updates as soon as there was news. After the officer left, Mike and Emily rushed to Tom, their faces full of worry. He knew they had been listening. They huddled together, seeking comfort. Emily started crying, and Mike's eyes filled with tears. Tom struggled to stay strong for his kids, though inside he was devastated. They couldn't concentrate on anything and spent the evening clinging to each other. They waited for a call that never came. Exhausted and scared, they finally fell asleep together in Tom's bed for the first time since the kids were small. The next morning, a search team representative called during breakfast. Hopes were dashed when they reported no findings. Tom informed the school principal about the children's absence, then found them watching news coverage of the missing plane. Unsure whether to let them watch, the phone rang again, triggering a flood of calls. Sarah's parents and his own were first, trying to be optimistic despite their worry. Tom promised to update them with any news. Calls from Sarah's friends and colleagues followed, each wanting to help but unsure how. The conversations were brief and awkward. The hardest were from the media. Caught off guard, Tom ended up talking longer than he intended with a local news reporter. He started screening calls, answering only those from loved ones. Friends and neighbors soon began arriving with condolences and food. Initially, Tom appreciated the meals as he had no energy to cook, but they quickly had more than they could eat. Each dish, a gesture of concern, became a painful reminder of his probable loss. The following days were terrible. The Johnsons, practically trapped in their home, avoided people and clung to the hope of news. Tom called the search office daily, but the reports were always grim. Five days later, a search officer called with the dreaded news. Wreckage of Sarah's plane had been found with no survivors. I'm sorry, sir, the officer concluded, but we must cease search and rescue efforts. Tom wanted to hide and mourn alone, but there was no time. He faced a daunting list of tasks, starting with breaking the news to Mike and Emily and comforting them. Once they calmed down, he had to call family and friends, arrange a memorial service, and write an obituary. By the end, Tom was drained. The family endured the service and slowly began returning to normal life. The children went back to school, which helped, but Tom struggled with new responsibilities. On a friend's advice, he contacted a lawyer about legal matters and was shocked to learn he needed a death certificate. But her plane crashed, Tom protested. I know, the lawyer said, but without a body, the court needs to issue an official statement. Do I really have to wait seven years? No, the lawyer assured him. Cases like this usually resolve quickly.
It'll draft a petition and help you amend other documents like bank accounts, mortgages, and insurance. Overwhelmed, Tom knew he also had to contact Sarah's company about benefits. He dreaded calling the widow of John Miller, the CFO, on the plane with Sarah. Although Tom disliked Miller, he felt it was his duty. When he called, Amanda Miller was already waiting. As they exchanged condolences, Tom realized she shared his grief. How are you, Tom? She asked. It's hard, Amanda. I can't accept she's gone. Everything reminds me of her. I keep thinking I see her in crowds, I said, staring at the floor, my emotions overwhelming me. Amanda sensed that no words could alleviate the pain. And you, Amanda, how are you holding up? I asked. It's tough, but I'm managing, she replied. John and I didn't have children, so it's a bit different for me. We weren't getting along before this. If he hadn't died, we were on the brink of a divorce. I'm sorry to hear that, I said genuinely. One moment I'm relieved I don't have to deal with his mess, and the next I feel guilty for not being sadder. But a part of me still misses him, she confessed. Will you be okay financially, I inquired. Ill manage. The company insured John's life, so we'll get twice the face value. But he made poor investments, and we lost a lot of money, she admitted. I wasn't shocked by John's behavior. Amanda's mention of company paid life insurance reminded me to contact Sarah's benefits department. After a bit more chatting, I rose to leave. Amanda, I need to go pick up Mike and Emily from school. Please keep in touch, and if you need anything, even just to talk, call me. When I got home with Mike and Emily, I was surprised to see a car parked outside. Leading the children through the garage, the doorbell rang. Outside stood a middle-aged man and a young woman in professional attire. I'm Special Agent Harold Barnes, and this is Special Agent Celia Murray. We're with the FBI. We'd like to ask you some questions about your wife's disappearance. Emily clung to my waist, her tears soaking my shirt. What does that mean? I asked, my voice laced with anger. Agent Murray stepped in. I'm sorry we upset your daughter, Mr. Johnson. We're just doing a routine check related to your application for Mrs. Johnson's death certificate. We can come back later if you prefer. I reassured Emily. It's okay, sweetheart. Nothing bad happened. Agent Murray knelt and offered Emily a napkin, which she hesitantly took to wipe her eyes. I then sent Emily to her room to do her homework. Turning to the agents, I said, If it won't take long, let's get it over with. We moved to the living room and sat around the coffee table. We need some information about your wife, Agent Barnes began. How long were you married? Since 1990, right after we graduated from college, I replied, picturing the beautiful brunette I had married. And she worked for the International Marketing Corporation until she disappeared, he asked. Yes, she was the VP of sales for the Midwest region, I answered. Why would she go to Chicago, Agent Murray inquired. The Midwest region included several states and their headquarters was in Chicago. Sarah often flew there, I explained. Sarah, the woman repeated. Was that her nickname? No, it was just her name, I said, feeling a bit defensive. Agent Murray patted me on the shoulder. It's okay, Mr. Johnson, I know this is hard. Agent Barnes changed the subject. Did your wife normally fly her own plane for business trips? Yes, her father was a pilot and she got her license young. She preferred flying herself to stay independent of commercial airline schedules, I said. What about you, Mr. Johnson? What do you do? Barnes asked. I'm a stay-at-home dad, I smiled. I was an aerospace engineer until three years ago when my company downsized. Moving for a new job wasn't an option, but Sarah's career was thriving, so we decided I'd handle the household and kids. And how did this change affect your relationship? Barnes probed. What's that got to do with anything? I snapped. Agent Murray interjected. We need to see if any factors played a role in your wife's disappearance. This is routine. I calmed down. It was a big change, but as an engineer, I evaluated all factors. It made sense for our family. Sarah focused on her career, and I took care of Mike and Emily. It wasn't easy. She was often busy with clients and meetings, and I felt her work came first. But that's common in corporate life, and things were going well. Two more questions, Mr. Johnson, Agent Barnes said. Did you notice any changes in your wife's behavior before she disappeared? Not really, I replied after a moment. 
She was under a lot of pressure in traveling more, but Sarah said she was in line for a promotion that would reduce her travel and come with a higher position and pay. One last question, Agent Barnes said, taking notes. Are you aware of any recent changes in your finances? No, I answered confidently. I manage our finances and haven't noticed anything unusual. Agent Murray handed me her card. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. If you think of anything else, please call me. The agents left and I checked on my children, who were busy with homework. They're strong kids, I thought. They've been through a lot and are holding up well. The next day, I visited IMC headquarters to discuss Sarah's benefits. The head of the department expressed condolences and handed me a box of Sarah's belongings, including a family portrait. A specialist reviewed Sarah's 401k account with me, revealing it was much higher than expected due to increased contributions. The specialist advised me to transfer the funds to my own IRA for easier management. I also learned about the substantial insurance benefit Sarah had chosen, which would provide an income for almost four years, paid out annually to minimize tax burdens. Taxes, the specialist mentioned, are contingent on obtaining Sarah's death certificate. After meeting with the FBI agents, Tom felt assured it would arrive soon. He sighed in relief, realizing he wouldn't need to job hunt immediately. Thank you, Sarah, he whispered softly. Days later, while Tom was preparing dinner, the doorbell rang. Special Agent Murray stood there informing him that the investigation was concluded and the death certificate had been issued. Tom exhaled deeply in relief. Suddenly, a panicked cry from Emily echoed from the back of the house. Dad, help me! Tom sprinted to her room with Agent Murray close behind. Emily stood frozen, staring at a large red stain on her jeans. I'm bleeding, Dad! She cried, tears streaming down her face. What happened, Emily? Tom asked, alarmed. Agent Murray stepped in. Let me handle this, she said firmly, guiding Tom out of the room. Wait in the living room. After 15 agonizing minutes, Celia emerged. Emily's fine. You need to go to the store and buy sanitary pads. Get the smallest size. But Emily, Mike, Tom stammered. I'll take care of Emily and explain to Mike. You go to the store and hurry back, she insisted. On the way, Tom realized Emily was having her first period. He chastised himself for not having prepared her for this moment. Oh, Sarah, I need you now more than ever, Tom thought. Upon returning home, Celia met him at the door and took the package. You did great, Dad she said with a warm smile. She returned to Emily's room. After 30 minutes, Celia reappeared, hugging Emily. Tom knelt and embraced his daughter. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I should have talked to you about this earlier. It's okay, Dad, Emily said. I just got scared. Celia explained everything. Now I know what to do. She held Celia's hand, and Tom realized his daughter had found a new friend. Turning to Celia, he said, Thank you. It's a good thing you were here. I'm not great with this kind of stuff. Celia smiled, but Mike interrupted. Does this mean we won't have dinner tonight? I'm starving. Emily shrieked, but Tom held her back. Mike, if you talk to your sister like that again, you'll go to bed hungry, Tom warned. Now go wash your hands and set the table. He turned to Celia. Please join us for dinner. Celia hesitated, but Emily tugged at her arm. Please, Celia, stay. Celia smiled and agreed. At dinner, the kids peppered Celia with questions about her work. Tom was amused and relieved to see his children starting to emerge from their sorrow. After dinner, Tom offered Celia some coffee. You seem really good with kids. Do you work with them often? He asked. I come from a large family, two brothers and three sisters. I was the oldest, so I was like a second mom, Celia explained. That's why I knew what to do with Emily. I help my sisters through similar situations. Tom grinned. I'm really glad you were here. I wouldn't have known what to do. Celia's expression turned serious. How are they coping with their mother's loss? Tom sighed. Emily is very clingy and Mike is moody and withdrawn. I don't know if it's because of Sarah's death or just being a teenager. Celia looked at him with understanding. You're doing a great job. It will take time for all of you. She stood up. I've stayed long enough. I'd like to say goodbye to Emily and Mike. 
She hugged Emily, who walked with her arm around Celia's waist. She really has a new friend, Tom thought. A few days later, a package arrived for Emily, a pink stuffed elephant and a note from Celia. Tom was puzzled by the choice, but was touched to see it take a prominent place on Emily's bed. I guess she still has a bit of a little girl in her, he admitted. He called Celia to thank her. Celia was pleased and asked Tom to keep in touch. Weeks later, Mike's teacher called to discuss some issues. Tom set up a meeting for the next day, but decided not to tell Mike until he had more information. Mrs. Sanders, the homeroom teacher, told Tom that Mike's behavior had worsened over the past few months. At first, I didn't want to say anything because I know he's been through a lot, she explained, but it seems to be getting worse. He's distracted, not doing homework, and not paying attention in class. If this continues, his grades will drop significantly. Tom was worried. How much of this is just being a teenager? He asked. It's a difficult age, especially for boys, she replied. But I think his mother's death is affecting him more than he lets on. You might want to consider seeing a psychologist. Tom thanked her and waited anxiously for the kids to finish gym class, determined to talk to Mike. He sent Emily to her room for homework and took Mike to the master bedroom. Seeing his father's serious expression, Mike knew he was in trouble. Tom recounted the teacher's concerns. What's going on, Mike? Why are you acting like this? Tom demanded. Just because, Mike muttered. Don't you care about your grades? Tom pressed. Not really, Mike replied sullenly. Annoyed by his son's attitude, Tom tried a different approach. What would your mother think? Who cares? She was a liar, Mike shouted angrily. Shocked, Tom grabbed his son. Don't talk about your mother like that. How can you say that? Mike whispered, I saw her with another man. He collapsed onto the bed, sobbing. Tom sat next to him, holding him. It's okay, he repeated, trying to calm him. When Mike's crying subsided, Tom asked gently, Tell me what you saw. It was last fall, Mike started, his voice cracking. I forgot my homework and came home to get it. I heard Mom come in and hid. Then I heard a man's voice. They went to your room, and when I peeked in, they were on the bed. Mike's words spilled out and he started crying again. Why did she do that, Dad? How could she betray us? Tom felt numb but focused on comforting Mike. Sometimes people make mistakes. It doesn't mean they didn't love us. Your mother loved you and Emily very much. Try to remember the good things about her. Tom talked to Mike until he calmed down, then sent him to do his homework. He asked Mike to keep this a secret from Emily and Mike agreed. That evening passed quietly. After the kids went to bed, Tom wrestled with his emotions. He wanted to deny what Mike had witnessed, but he knew his son was too upset to have misunderstood. Tom felt an overwhelming sense of betrayal. How could Sarah have cheated on him? Who was the man? How long had it been going on? Losing her in a plane crash was hard enough, but realizing he had lost her long before that was devastating. He couldn't sleep that night. The next day, Tom went to the gym, hoping exercise would clear his mind. But while running on the treadmill, his thoughts kept drifting back to Sarah's infidelity. How could she do that in our bed? It must have been during one of those times I went to the gym. His routine had made it easy for her to plan. If she scheduled her meetings around my workouts, it wasn't spontaneous. How often did she meet him? Her frequent travels could have been a cover. Each question led to more anguish. Tom tried to act normal around Mike and Emily, but he was struggling. He went to the pharmacy for antacids, something he had never needed before. He felt trapped, unable to talk to anyone about his discovery. Telling his parents or Sarah's family would devastate them, and he didn't want neighborhood gossip or schoolmates teasing his kids. One evening, he spotted Celia Murray's business card on his desk. Desperate for someone to talk to, he called her. Celia was glad to hear from him, but worried when he said he needed to talk. Are Emily and Mike okay? she asked. They're fine, but I'm not. Can we meet for lunch tomorrow? She agreed and suggested a quiet cafe near her office. Tom felt a bit of relief. Celia was already there when he arrived at the restaurant. Seeing his troubled face, she asked, Tom, what's going on? 
You wanted more information about my wife, he began. I found out Sarah was cheating on me. Tears welled up in his eyes. Celia reached across the table and held his hands. Oh, Tom, that's horrible. Tell me everything. He recounted the meeting with Mike's teacher, confronting Mike and Mike's revelation. Celia listened intently. Poor Mike, she said. No wonder he's having a hard time at school and dealing with her death. This makes it even harder. She squeezed Tom's hands. I can't imagine what you're going through. Did you see any signs? No, he replied. I'm always the last to know. Our intimacy declined after her promotion, but I thought it was due to job stress. She kept saying things would get better, but they didn't. Now I have so many questions. Who was he? How long did it last? Was she planning to leave me? Why did she do this to us? Celia squeezed his hands again. Tom, you might never get all the answers. With her gone, it doesn't change anything now. Focus on your family and yourself. I know you're right, but it hurts. I keep wondering when she stopped loving me. No, Celia said firmly. Sarah cared about you and the kids. She took out the maximum life insurance and maxed out her 401k to make sure you were provided for. She cared. Thank you, Celia. I'll try to keep that in mind. As they stood to leave, he noticed they hadn't touched their food. I guess I'm not the best lunch companion. Don't worry, she replied. Skipping a meal or two is fine. He looked at her and thought she looked beautiful. Stay in touch, Tom, and let me know if you need anything, she said, kissing his cheek. As she walked away, Tom thought he saw her blush. Back at home, Tom felt a surprising sense of relief. I guess I needed to talk it out, he thought. The following Saturday, while cleaning up storm debris in the yard, Tom noticed Emily on the phone. He asked Mike, Did someone call? No, Mike replied. She's talking to her new best friend, Celia. Does she call Celia a lot? And what's a BFF? Oh, Dad, Mike sighed. BFF means best friend forever. Emily looked up and asked, Daddy, can we invite Celia to dinner? Let me talk to her, Tom said, taking the phone. Hi, Celia. Would you like to join us for dinner tonight? She quickly agreed. Great. See you around six o'clock, Tom said, turning to Emily. She's coming. Let's clean up so she doesn't think we live like slobs. Oh, Dad, do I have to? Mike complained but started tidying up. Tom decided to make a special salmon dish which meant a trip to the grocery store. He found a nice piece of salmon, picked up dessert, a bottle of wine, and a bouquet of flowers. I guess I'm going all out, he thought. Celia arrived at six o'clock and Emily welcomed her warmly. Even Mike was polite. Tom felt a bit awkward, but Celia seemed at ease. She chatted with Emily and admired her room while Tom finished preparing dinner. The meal was a success and Celia teased, a man who can cook, my mother warned me about you. After dinner, Celia helped with the cleanup. With the kids occupied, Tom and Celia filled their wine glasses and moved to the living room. Tom, dinner was wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Emily wouldn't forgive me if I hadn't, Tom laughed. She's a delightful girl and you're doing a great job, Celia said. Then her tone became serious. Tom, I need to tell you something confidential, Celia started, her tone somber. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation conducted a thorough review before issuing your wife's death certificate. While Sarah's record was clean, John Miller's situation was different. He was in serious financial trouble due to poor investments. Tom nodded, recalling Amanda Miller's words, IMC's security team discovered major discrepancies in the Southeastern Accounting Department managed by John. They found a fraudulent billing scheme that may have funneled millions out of IMC, apparently with John's approval. Poor Amanda, Tom sighed. She didn't deserve this. However, Celia's revelations sparked new suspicions. Could Miller have caused the crash to hide his crimes? What if Sarah found out? Could he be in hiding? Tom mused. Tom, don't jump to conclusions, Celia cautioned. The most plausible scenario is still the plane crash being an accident. We'll investigate all angles, but let's not rush to assumptions. Do you think Sarah had any involvement? Tom asked, anxiety clear in his voice. It's highly unlikely, Celia replied. There were no signs she planned to leave her family. Unlike Miller, whose marriage was falling apart, Sarah's finances were stable. This is all just speculation. 
The only concrete fact we have is that the plane crashed. Tom, please promise me you won't share this information. It could jeopardize the investigation and my job, Celia warned. I understand and I promise, Tom said. But why tell me? You might come across something relevant. Promise me you'll let me know immediately and not try to handle it on your own, she urged. I promise, Tom replied, feeling slightly relieved. Besides, I value our conversations. Celia smiled warmly, her face lighting up. She bid farewell to Mike and Emily. Tom noticed Mike paused his game to say goodnight, which was rare. Emily walked Celia to the door, making her promise to call. Celia kissed Tom on the cheek before leaving. She likes you, Dad, Emily teased. I like her too, Tom replied, hugging Emily. That night, Tom lay in bed pondering Celia's information and imagining different scenarios. Oh, Sarah, he thought, what were you caught up in? Eventually, he drifted into a fitful sleep. A week later, while checking sports news online, Tom noticed the Facebook icon. On a whim, he clicked it. Tom rarely used Facebook except to keep an eye on his children's activities. He insisted Mike and Emily add him as a friend and share their passwords, encouraging them to be cautious online. Logging in, Tom saw mostly mundane posts, but noticed a friend request from Tom Thomason, a name he didn't recognize. There was no photo, just a silhouette. Clicking on the name, he found the stranger's profile was private. Hey, Mike, Tom called out. Do you know a Thomason? No, Mike replied. He's been trying to friend me for weeks. I just delete his requests. Emily peeked in. Yeah, he tried to friend me too. He's just some creep on Facebook. Tom was alarmed. An unknown person trying to contact not only him but his children was troubling. He reassured them, you did the right thing. Never respond to strangers online. Then an idea struck him. Maybe Celia can help us figure out who this Thomason is. He called her, and she answered warmly. Hi, Tom. Hi, Celia. Can you come over? Something strange has come up, and I need your help. Mike and Emily are okay, right? She asked, concerned. They're fine, he assured her. She promised to arrive in 45 minutes. Tom was impressed by her punctuality and appearance. You look great, Celia. You didn't need to dress up for us, he said. Thank you, Tom. I wanted to, she replied. Tom called the children over, and Mike quickly logged into their Facebook account, showing the friend requests from Tom Thomason. Celia praised Mike's skills and examined the messages but found nothing useful. It's probably a marketing scam, she told them. Never share your information with strangers, okay? The children nodded seriously, taking her advice to heart. As it got dark, Tom suggested they go out for dinner and invited Celia to join. The kids eagerly insisted, and she agreed. They went to a casual restaurant where Celia engaged the kids in conversation. Tom realized Celia probably knew more about their lives than Sarah had. The lively chat continued during dinner and the drive home, and Celia joined them inside. The kids asked Celia to watch TV with them, but she declined. I need to talk to your dad, she said, leading Tom to the living room and turning serious. I don't think those Facebook requests were a marketing ploy. The Bureau has alerts about identity theft scams, but they don't usually target kids. Someone might be trying to get your family's information. Tom felt a chill. Who could it be? What do they want? I don't know. This doesn't fit any cyber fraud model I've seen, Celia said. What can we do? Tom asked. Close their Facebook accounts? Keep them off the internet? She thought for a moment. If they're careful and don't communicate with strangers or click on suspicious links, they should be okay. But I have a friend in the federal government who might help. He might not find Tom Thomason, but he could trace his location. I'll call on Monday and let you know. With those words, she got up and went to say goodnight to Mike and Emily. When she returned, Tom walked her to the door. Before she opened it, he hugged her. You've been like a guardian angel to us, he said sincerely. Celia smiled. I'm glad I can help, Tom. Stay in touch. I can't imagine what we would have done without you, Tom said, his eyes meeting Celia's. She held his gaze for a moment before leaning in and kissing him on the lips. I don't want to be an angel, she said with a playful wink. They don't get to have any fun. With that, she turned and hurried to her car, leaving Tom standing there, stunned.
True to her word, Celia called Tom late Monday morning. Do you know anyone in Palm Beach, Florida? She asked. Not a soul, Tom replied. Whoever Tom Thomason is, he set up his Facebook account with a zip code starting with 334, which places him in Palm Beach County, she explained. I can't think why someone in Palm Beach would be interested in us, Tom said, but at least he's not nearby. That's a bit of a relief. I agree, Celia said. We've been monitoring a lot of scams originating from South Florida, so maybe this is just a new kind of internet scam. Just make sure Mike and Emily stay away from those friend requests. I will, Celia. Thanks for easing my mind. I'm happy to help, Tom. Despite what he told Celia, Tom remained deeply troubled. It felt like a series of relentless attacks, first Sarah's death, then Mike's revelation about his mother's affair, followed by the discovery of Sarah's potential involvement in fraud. Now, an unknown individual was trying to get close to his children. Tom felt besieged and knew he had to take action. His first goal was to track down the person in Palm Beach County, but how? With over a million people in the area, finding Tom Thomason would be like searching for a needle in a haystack. Plus, the name could easily be fake. Tom's analytical mind kept working on the problem until he had an idea. If I can't find Thomason, maybe I can lure him to me. A plan began to form. The chances were slim, but it was all he had. The first step was to ensure Mike and Emily were out of harm's way. With summer vacation approaching, Tom had an idea. He called his in-laws. Dad, would you and Mom like Mike and Emily to visit for a week? I need to go out of town, so it would be a big help. When their grandfather happily agreed and all the details were sorted out, Tom booked a flight to Palm Beach. His children were excited about visiting their grandparents, but less enthusiastic when they learned their father wouldn't be joining them. This would be their first separation since their mother's death, and it stirred up feelings of abandonment. Tom hated causing them distress, but felt it was necessary and managed to persuade them. As the departure date neared, Tom began doubting his decision. Am I making the right choice? He wondered. Yet doing nothing seemed worse. His thoughts were interrupted by a call from Celia, checking in on him and the kids. After some small talk, her voice grew tentative. I was wondering if you'd like to get together next week. I haven't seen you and the kids in a while, she said softly. I'd love to, Celia, but I'm taking the kids to their grandparents. We'll be gone all week. Oh, she said, sounding disappointed. Maybe another time, then. I'd like that very much, Celia, he said earnestly. Tom felt guilty about not being entirely honest with Celia, but at least it was partly true. He knew she would try to talk him out of his plan if she knew the details. After dropping the kids off with their grandparents, Tom returned home and logged onto the family computer. He had chosen Sarah's family because they didn't have a computer, making it safe to use Emily's Facebook account. Sure enough, a friend request from Tom Thomason had arrived. Tom accepted it quickly confirming that Emily was now friends with the stranger. If nothing comes of this, I'll just unfriend him later, Tom thought. Next came the difficult part, pretending to be a 12-year-old girl. He studied Emily's previous messages and felt confident he could mimic her style. I might not fool her friends, he thought, but I hope I can trick Tom Thomason. He decided his first message should be simple and wrote a brief update about her trip. Emily here. Just a little news for my friends, Tom thought. Nothing to raise suspicion. The next day, he set the bait. OMG, I'm going to Florida. My best friend Celia invited me and my dad said yes. Flying out tomorrow, can't wait. Tom decided to use Celia's name, thinking that neither Emily's friends nor Tom Thomason knew her. He hoped Celia wouldn't mind. With the trap set, Tom waited, hoping to catch the fish's attention. I can't believe I'm in Palm Beach. This is incredible. That evening, Tom posted, spent the whole day at the beach, and I'm going to get so tan. The next morning, he posted again, hoping to attract attention. Back to the beach tonight. Tomorrow, Celia is taking me shopping on Worth Avenue, and we'll have lunch at Taboo. As soon as the post went live on Emily's profile, Tom headed to Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport. 
shortly after he was settled in his seat for the flight to Palm Beach. Gazing out the window, memories of his honeymoon with Sarah in Miami Beach flooded back. They had once driven through Palm Beach, admiring the grand homes along Southern Ocean Boulevard. After landing, Tom rented a car and drove to his motel in West Palm Beach. He picked up a quick meal from a nearby fast food joint and ate in his room while reviewing a map of the area on his laptop. He hoped his plan would work. The next morning, he checked Emily's Facebook page, but only saw some envious comments from her friends. He didn't expect Thomason to reach out immediately, but he hoped this trip might yield some clues. Around mid-morning, Tom drove towards Worth Avenue, crossing the Royal Park Bridge and navigating through the bustling streets. He wanted to be there early enough to park nearby in case he needed to make a quick exit. After several loops around the block, he finally found a parking spot. He set the meter and walked down the street, eyeing a shaded bench. Taking a seat, he put on his sunglasses and pretended to read a newspaper while observing the people passing by. As he sat there, doubts began to creep in. His plan seemed flimsy. What were the chances that Thomason had seen the fake posts on Emily's Facebook page or would show up? And even if he did, how would Tom recognize him? The street was filled with tourists and locals alike, making it hard to single out anyone. Time dragged on, and the restaurant started to fill up with lunchtime patrons. Tom's stomach growled as he watched people enjoy their meals. He cursed himself for not packing another sandwich, but didn't dare leave his spot. As the crowd in the restaurant began to thin, he realized he had been waiting for over an hour. What an idiot, he thought. I could have stayed home and avoided this wild goose chase. Then, just as he was about to give up, he noticed a woman crossing the street who caught his attention. Here we go again, Tom thought, reminded of Sarah. The woman, however, was a blonde with a short haircut, nothing like Sarah's brunette waves but something about her gait seemed familiar. Impulsively, Tom got up and followed her. He saw the blonde reach the corner and try to hail a cab. Acting quickly, Tom dashed across the street to his car. Just as he pulled away from the curb, he spotted the woman entering a cab that sped down the avenue. Tom followed, navigating through the streets until the cab turned onto a quiet residential road near Lake Worth. He parked a distance away and watched as the woman exited the cab and approached an elegant house. Tom squinted, trying to get a clear view. Despite the different hairstyle, she matched Sarah's height and build. As she walked towards the house, Tom was struck again by her gait. Sitting in his car, he remembered a book he had read long ago about an actor changing his walk to avoid recognition. Could it be her? Suppressing his anger, Tom approached the house and rang the doorbell. He stood with his arms crossed, waiting. The woman opened the door, looking confused. Then recognition dawned, and she gasped, Tom, what are you doing here? Hello, Sarah. Funny seeing you here, he said sarcastically. After a moment's hesitation, she reached out to hug him, but he stepped back. Don't touch me, he snapped. How could you do this to me? How could you abandon Mike and Emily? Sarah glanced nervously outside, then grabbed his arm and pulled him into the house, slamming the door. I did it all for you and the kids, she pleaded. You have to believe me. It was the only way out. What are you talking about? Tom demanded. None of this makes any sense. Please sit down, she urged, wringing her hands. Let me explain everything. I was so close, baby, I had a big promotion lined up, Sarah began, her voice trembling. But then the economy tanked. I knew if I could boost our region sales, the company would recover and I'd secure the promotion. We'd be set for life. No worries about the kids' college, retirement, anything. Tom could barely contain his anger. Was it all about money and your position? Sarah's hands trembled in her lap. John Miller and I, she began, but Tom interrupted. Miller? Seriously? She ignored his tone and continued. Yes, John and I devised a plan to shift some sales figures from our biggest accounts. We knew they'd show up eventually, so we booked them early for the current quarter. While other regions showed a decrease, ours showed an increase. The company was thrilled, and we got the largest bonuses ever. But as the economy worsened, John told me it would eventually be discovered, so we had to act. Tom's eyes narrowed. 
So you faked your death in a plane crash to cover it up? That's right, she said, almost proudly. With enough money, it's not hard to get someone to drop a GPS-equipped Zodiac motorboat in the Caribbean. We just homed in on the signal and landed nearby. Tom felt a surge of bitterness. So it was all about stealing money and abandoning your family? No, baby, no, she pleaded. I had to disappear for a while, but I made sure you and the kids would be okay. I took out life insurance and maxed out my 401k so you'd have plenty of money. Tom's voice was icy. And you thought money would make up for losing their mother? Sarah's eyes darted around the room. No, you don't understand. I plan to come back once things settle down. We could start fresh somewhere safe, together. Tom stared at her. You forgot about your affair with John Miller. Sarah's face fell. She reached out, but Tom stepped back. No, baby, it wasn't like that. We were just co-workers. Don't lie to me, Tom snapped. Mike saw you two together in our bedroom. She sighed, tears forming. Oh, God, Mike saw us. It only happened once, baby. John said he wouldn't help unless I slept with him. It was just one time, I swear. Tom turned away, his mind racing. Come out, John, I know you're here, he called loudly. Sarah's protests turned into wails, but John Miller emerged from a bedroom wearing a robe and carrying a gun. Easy, Mary, he knows, Miller muttered, his tone cold and hard. Looks like your kids are going to lose both their parents, he said, raising his weapon towards Tom. Before Miller could react, a voice rang out from the hallway. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Celia Murray stepped forward. A Smith and Wesson aimed at Miller. Miller froze as Special Agent Harold Barnes emerged from the kitchen. Drop the weapon, Miller, it's over, Barnes commanded, his gun also trained on Miller. Miller's shoulders slumped, and he dropped his weapon. Celia swiftly moved behind him, twisting his arm and snapping handcuffs around his wrists. She did the same with Sarah, securing them both on the floor. Barnes called the Palm Beach Police Department, then the local FBI office. Shortly after, the house was swarming with officers. Tom watched in disbelief as the fugitives were led away. Miller muttered to himself while Sarah cried, neither looking back at Tom. Celia approached Barnes, hugged him, and kissed him on the cheek. Thanks for having my back, partner. You don't owe me anything, Agent Barnes said, smiling. Just doing my job. Solving this case benefits everyone. When Barnes left, Celia turned to Tom. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she wrapped her arms around his neck. You idiot. Don't you ever scare me like that again. You could have been killed, she sobbed. Tom held her close until she calmed down, then gently pulled back to look at her. What are you doing here? How did you know where to find me? He asked, bewildered. She wiped her tears and smiled. Emily called me and mentioned you weren't with them at their grandparents. I had a hunch you were up to something risky. I saw her Facebook posts called the airline and found out you had flown to Palm Beach. I convinced Harold to come with me and we've been tailing you since this morning. We almost lost you when you chased that cab, but Harold guessed where you were headed. Tom hugged her tighter. You really are my guardian angel, he said, kissing her gently. Two years later, Tom braced against the chilly, damp wind blowing off Puget Sound. Despite the cold, he felt a sense of relief. The past two years had been a whirlwind. Discovering Sarah alive was shocking, but the fallout was even more painful for Mike and Emily. Her arrest and subsequent trial for multiple crimes only added to their suffering. The media circus surrounding the case was relentless, and Tom worried about his children's well-being. The divorce went through quickly. Legally, Sarah was no longer considered dead, but she was sentenced to 12 years in Arendelle State Prison. IMC demanded the return of Sarah's life insurance payout and most of her 401k contributions as they were based on fraudulent earnings. Though Tom had a right to some of the money, he wanted nothing to do with Sarah's ill-gotten gains. Desperately needing work, he was grateful for a job offer from a large aerospace company which meant relocating across the country. Leaving Atlanta and its painful memories behind was a welcome change for Tom and his children. Seattle provided a fresh start, away from the constant reminders and questions that plagued them in Atlanta. They managed to sell their house in Atlanta, 
and buy a cozy, smaller home in Seattle. Sarah had always wanted a grand, luxurious house, but Tom preferred something more modest. The kids adapted quickly and were already making new friends at their school. As Tom walked back into the house from the deck, he searched for his car keys. Finding them, he called out to his wife. Angel, let's go pick up the kids, he said. Celia appeared from the kitchen, smiling brightly. Ready when you are, she replied.